Hey everyone, my name is Mario and I am a Cinemagraph creator and I also run a Cinemagraph Instagram account called Cinepix. So as you're spending a lot of time on Instagram every day, you must have come across Cinemagraphs and if you're not sure, Cinemagraphs are images that look like beautiful still photographs with a small bit of motion in them. They are becoming a lot more popular and today we want to talk to you about how you can create one of them. One thing to remember about Cinemagraphs is that they do need to look like really good photographs. So all the principles that you would apply to a good looking photograph, all the rules that you would commit to, the story you want to tell, the atmosphere you want to create, all of those need to be part of your Cinemagraph. So just because you can create a Cinemagraph and just because there's a bit of motion in it doesn't mean that a shot of your cat licking its paw is necessarily going to make a great Cinemagraph. Although feel free to experiment. But when we're talking about brands and appetizers, they are looking for people who can apply photographic quality to their cinemagraphs. So looking at cinemagraphs, there's essentially three different principles you can look at to plan the shots and plan the motion that you want to capture. Number one, the first principle you can look at is what I call infinite flow. So this is where you've got something that is giving you a consistent flow of motion and there's seemingly no end or beginning. And this can apply primarily to things like fire, wind, water, maybe earth if you've got some sand in your, in your hand, so maybe the elements, if you think about the elements that you can use, all of these make it really easy because there's a continuous flow and you don't really need to focus so much on the start and the beginning of your shot. The second principle we look at for motion in cinemagraphs is a looping system. So this is something that completes a whole loop and is easily repeatable so that you can make a really good cinemagraph out of those. So examples could be a Ferris wheel or a merry-go-round at a fairground, something like the London Eye, or even a time-lapse on the face of the watch. The third and final principle we look at for motion and cinemagraphs is repetition. So potentially something moving backwards and forwards. Examples of these would be earrings on a model's ear. You could also do boxing cinemagraphs, for instance, someone sparring in front of a boxing bag. And the example we have today is a tea bag that we'll be swinging right over a teacup. I know most people watching this tutorial probably come from a photographic background where you're used to using photographic settings and photographic principles and maybe even photographic lights. But it's good to remember that when we're talking about cinemagraphs, we are talking about video. So the key points you need to look at to shoot professional looking video on your DSLR or your mirrorless camera is frame rate, your shutter speed, your white balance and lighting. So when we're talking about video and you're considering your lighting, it is important to remember that video does not work with strobe lights. So if your background is in photography, portrait photography or interior photography where you've been using strobe lights or flashes, those lights are not going to work for your video. So if you're ever in a setting like we are today and you want to use lights in your cinemagraphs, you are going to need to get constant lights. So we're talking about LED lights or powered lights, any sort of video lights or film lights that you can get your hands on. For the next three technical settings that I mentioned, the frame rates, the shutter speed and the white balance, I'll be taking you through my own camera, which is a Sony Alpha camera. It's an A7S Mark II, which is very, very good for video. Probably one of the best cameras I've ever owned. But also remember that you do not need a camera like this. You can shoot on Nikon, Panasonic, Canon. There's many cameras that have all the settings that I'll run through right now. So when we're talking about frame rates, we're talking about essentially three different frame rates. It's 24 frames a second, 25 frames a second, or 30 frames a second. Those are the bases that you'll find on a camera. So my camera is on power at the moment, which means that the frame rates that I have available to me are essentially different versions of 25 frames a second. So there's a 25 frames that I can choose, there's 50 frames which allows me to have a little bit of a slow motion or I can even go to 100 frames per second. If I'm shooting in 4K, my options are generally limited. 4K essentially is the highest resolution I can shoot at at the moment. It's four times HD quality and my settings then will only allow me to shoot 25 frames a second. So once you've set your frame rate, the next thing you need to set is your shutter speed. The shutter speed settings will be on different buttons or different locations for different cameras. Mine is over here with this adjustment over here where the shutter speed will change. So the rule of thumb is that if you're shooting at 25 frames a second, your shutter speed number should be essentially double what your frame rate is. So I've selected 50 here, which is twice of 25. So you can see then my shutter is one over 50th. If you're shooting at 24 frames a second, there isn't a 48th of a second shutter speed on these cameras, so you would still shoot 1 50th. But if you were shooting at 30 frames a second, you would then go to 60. And this same rule would apply to you shooting uh, 50 frames a second. If you, if you were to shoot 50 frames a second, you would then up your shutter to go to 100 
of a second. And the same would apply if you were to shoot 100 frames a second and you would then use a 200th of a second shutter. This all has to do with motion blur, but the key is just to remember your shutter speed needs to be twice the number. So we'll go back to 50th of a second, which is what my shutter needs to be for this frame rate. So the final setting we have to look at is your white balance. And white balance is essentially how the camera interprets the color white under different types of light. So you may or you may not know that a lot of house lights and generally they refer to as tungsten lights have a bit of an orange color, which is what we're seeing at the moment on the shot. We've got a light there that's, that's pointing from just opposite the camera onto this platform here with the cup. And so we're seeing a bit of an orange light. So the way to accommodate for that would actually be to go to your light setting and then you'll see a lot of blue coming in. The reason the blue is coming in is because there's a window behind us with a lot of daylight and daylight tends to be already blue. So depending on what light source you use, you would be using some of these presets usually, but in our scenario, I'm going to dial in a custom temperature, which will give me a balance between the two. And I'm pretty happy with about 39 Kelvin. So that's where we're gonna be for this shoot. And uh, just remember that you may have to play around with getting the best settings when you're shooting your image shots. So for our example today, we're shooting a cinemagraph here where we want to create the look of a tea bag just swinging over a teacup, just floating in the air and moving backwards and forwards in complete repetition. So along with that, we've got some cherries and some biscuits just to make it look like a uh, setup on a table. But uh, really what we'll be focusing on is this swinging tea bag. The technical aspect of this setup is using a stand with some magic arms so that we can securely mount the tea bag right over the teacup. The reason for this is because if you, if you were to hold this with your hand, your hand would probably move a little bit during the entire process. And that would also break the cinemagraph. The other aspect of our setup here is that we've got our camera securely mounted on a tripod. Again, for the same reason, the cinemagraph that we create is going to have the illusion of a single image, but really what it is, is a still image over some video. So if you mask through the still image to get the motion and there's any movement in that shot, so for instance, a handheld camera, then what's going to happen is that your cinemagraph will really break and it won't look like a seamless image. So your camera or your mobile phone or whatever it is that you shoot on always needs to be on something secure and ideally be on a tripod. So now that we've got our setup, we're ready to shoot. So the first thing I'm going to do is start record. And usually what I actually do is use a remote so that I don't touch the camera because it's so tempting to want to touch the camera, change the focus and therefore introducing a bit of motion into the camera. So I'm using a remote, but you don't need to. And what I've done is I've started the record over here. So it's recording video and I'm just going to swing this tea bag back, on, back and forth. So we're capturing the tea bag essentially just moving backwards and forwards over the teacup. If you're very happy with your take, you don't need to shoot anything more than maybe about 15 to 20 seconds of video. So I'm shooting a little bit longer than 15 to 20 seconds at the moment because I want to show you how to process a longer file in the edit, just in case you do have a long take, you don't have the ability to stop and record in between your takes. So while we do that, we're just going to make sure that we have a few takes of this tea bag swinging backwards and forwards over the teacup. Okay, so I've stopped my record there and we have recorded about half a minute of video there. So once we've recorded our video take, the final thing I do is to take a still of the scene. And the reason for that is, is because at the moment we have a bit of sunlight spilling onto the windowsill in the background and that causes an overexposure. So when you have video where something is overexposed, you can never bring back those details. And having a still, usually in a raw format, means that you can bring back some of those stills and you can paint it back over your image so that you can have a complete image without any hotspots or any overexposed areas. So once we've backed up all of our files onto the computer, we can go ahead and create our cinema graphs. The software I use are two programs generally for a lot of my work, which is Photoshop and a program called Cinemagraph Pro, which is a completely professional Cinemagraph dedicated program. And uh, it does come with its own subscription, so whether or not you want to go for that is, is up to you, but it is one of the best programs out there with which you can make cinemagraphs. It makes the process a lot easier, and as you'll see in a minute, it's a really simple way of making cinemagraphs. You can also make your cinemagraphs in other video applications like Final Cut Pro, Premiere Pro, After Effects, and on Windows, there's a whole host of different programs available. But for the purposes of our demonstration, we'll be working between Photoshop and Cinemagraph Pro. Okay, so we've opened the video file in Cinemagraph Pro and as you can see, nothing is happening at the moment. That's because it takes a JPEG image and overlays it over the video. So essentially what we're seeing is a still image and a video image combined. If I were to brush a bit of a hole in there, you would see a bit of the video movement underneath. 
The other reason I open up the file in Cinemagraph Pro first is because it is a very long video file. This was nearly a minute long and if you were to take that to Photoshop you end up with a, a lot of video that has a lot of unnecessary information in it because we're really only looking for a short few seconds. And if you were to then render that you would take a very long time to wait for the render because Photoshop is just not optimized for video but it does give us some options in making Cinemagraphs that I really like. So. What we want to do is to do the initial selection. So as I move the handles, you'll see that there's a bit of a ghosting image going on. And that's, that's because we have a handle that's giving us the option to select a point where our starting point for the teabag would happen. So there's a purple line over here that I can drag to wherever the teabag needs to start or finish. And that would be the beginning of our cinemagraph. So over here, you can see as I'm moving it, my hand is going up and then I let go of the teabag and it keeps on swinging. And the more I move it, the more the teabag stops swinging. So I'm probably going to select a point for the teabag to stop somewhere over here. And we will go for the furthest point that it moves to so that it comes to a clear halt before it moves back that way. And that looks to be it. So that is our reference image to start with. And what we're going to do then is select the motion path. So underneath all of this, you'll see that the, the teabag is moving around and it's swinging back and forth as I'm dragging the selection. So I'm really only looking for a small motion and uh, I'll show you exactly two different ways that you can create the cinematograph out of this. I'm looking for a single swing moving forward and it looks like this is now just one motion, whereas if I were to drag it on, it will swing back. So if we go back to the original end point, that will then show a bit of emotion. So what I want to do now is just increase the brush size so that I can mask over all of this and we can see the teabag swinging. So what you see now is that it's moving and it's bouncing back every time and that's because we've only got one of the pendulum swings. What we can do to make this into a cinemagraph is use a bounce option instead of a repeat option. So over here, there's an option for us to choose two different ways of making a cinemagraph. And if I were to choose the bounce option, that would then make the teabag swing backwards and forwards. The problem with the bounce option sometimes is that it comes to a really strong stop and it doesn't really give you that natural sort of slow down at the end and then this acceleration again to the other direction. So instead, I am actually going to use this the repeat option and that means that we want a full swing going on. So to get the full swing, I'll just select a full motion path. Okay, that looks fairly good to me. What you see there, there's a bit of a ghosting effect going on and that's a fade that's happening. So we have, a, by default, Cinemagraph Pro has a fade that is set to um, 0.2, uh, which I think is about a fifth of the duration of your selection. So it's about 20%, but we want to take that to complete zero so that there's no fading happening. And now you can see that there's a whole swing happening right on its own. So once you've exported your initial Cinemagraph file, I'm then going to open it in Photoshop. And the reason I choose Photoshop over After Effects or Premiere Pro or any of the other applications is because Cinemagraphs need to look like really good photos. And for me, I find that Photoshop has a few different tools in there that are not available to other applications. And they can just help you to fine tune that photographic quality and the photographic content that you really want in your Cinemagraph. So we'll go ahead and open this in Photoshop. Okay, so once it's open in Photoshop, the first thing you'll see is that you've got a timeline at the bottom, which would be a new introduction from people who normally just do stills in Photoshop. So Photoshop has a timeline option, and this is where your video is lying. So the first thing you need to do is to go to your video group at the top in your layers panel and right click on it and go convert to smart object. 
The reason we want this to be a smart object is because it means we can layer different things on top of it, we can add adjustment layers and we can do all sorts of things and they're all non-destructive so they won't affect your video at all. They're just going to be extra effects and extra applications that will really help us to hone in on the shot that we want. Okay. And just as a next step, I'll show you also how to bring in the photograph that I took where we were talking about how an overexposed area in your shot can be brought in by using a photograph instead of just using the video file. So I will then go and open this video file. Oh, sorry, the photograph. So upon import, if you're used to shooting raw stills, you'll probably have all sorts of different settings that you always like to implement. Um, I'm not going to be doing, I'm not going to be doing too many of these for the purposes of this demonstration. Um, but just touching a few things, like for instance, recovering the highlights that we lost in the video file, so that we can show how having the still as an extra backup and actually help you complement the shot if you lost any detail. Uh, we'll also bring in a little bit of contrast and then maybe a bit of clarity, just with that extra bit of punch, and then open the image. Because the challenge we'll have is that when you're using still in a video, you also need to match the two, so they need to look very similar to be able to create that effect of it being a single shot. So if your, your settings are too extreme on the, on the raw end, it's gonna be a real challenge to try and get those same settings and the same look on your video file. So when you import your still, the idea is that you try and keep your, your raw settings to a minimum until you've matched your video and your still, and then we can go and change some of the settings a little bit further. So let's just open this image. So we have our image here in, uh, in our Photoshop document, and you'll notice now that there's no timeline, and this is just because it's a, it's a complete new document and it's not a video file. So what I'll do is just right click on it and duplicate the layer back on to my tea bag. It's also worth noting that on my camera I shot the stills as a 16x9 format because that's the same format we use for video. So by default the still might be a 4x3 or a 3x2 format which makes it a lot more square but it also means that you have a lot more work to do to crop your shot to be able to match your video. So having shot it in 16x9 means that I don't really have to move around my crops at all. It should match as the same shot, it's just a matter of scaling it down. So we've selected the layer we want to duplicate it on. And if we go back to this layer, we'll see. So for us to duplicate our file back into our video, we'll just go and select duplicate options and uh, select the document that we want to duplicate it in. And when we open the video for the document, we'll see again that the still has been added. When you open your stills in a timeline document, you'll see by default your stills are five seconds long. So if your video clip is shorter than that or longer than that, you'll just have to trim it, which is really easily done by just dragging and selecting the uh, still file. The next thing is that our still would have now been a little bit larger than the video file. So what I'm gonna do is just bring down my opacity or you can use the difference format as well, just to show how you can line up your still. So I'm just using a free transform and the idea is to get away, get away from as much of a difference in the shot. So any lines or any little bits of detail that looks like there's a difference will show you that it's not 100% lined up. You may need to nudge it just a little bit. So that looks like we've really lined it up fairly well. And uh, the next thing we'll do is set our blending mode back to normal. We'll hit enter just to make sure that we've, we've actually registered the transform tool and then we'll bring back our opacity. And so now when we're swapping in between these shots, we can see that there's pretty much a good lineup. There's a bit of a jump in the background. So if we need to, we can move around the, the, either the still or the video file, but um, there's a fairly good lineup. The other difference you'll notice is a bit of a difference in color. Again, this is due to raw capturing a lot more information than a video file can capture. So we'll just have to look at how we can blend those. Okay, so the first thing we'll do is add a layer mask to our still shot. And with our layer mask selected, that means now I can brush away anything that I don't want. And seeing as the still was taken with the teabag hanging straight down, we definitely don't want this part here. 
So we'll brush away on the, um, the stills teaback just so that we can show the video teaback coming through. So this is very similar to what we did in Cinemagraph Pro where we're creating a mask. So if I were to click the opacity on the layer underneath, which is the video file, you'll see that there's just a big hole. So that seems to work really well for us. And um, we've got some detail back in the windowsill here, which we didn't have before. So if you look at the difference, it's really bright in the video file and then it's really much better. So it's really bright in the video file and then it's much better back in the, uh, in the still format. So if I scroll through the timeline and bear in mind that it may not play as smoothly as it would in a different video app because Photoshop does struggle sometimes with video, especially if it's really high resolution video. So if it's in 4K or even HD, it could struggle on your computer or your laptop. So that's nothing to worry about. But what we want to see is just that there's nothing of the mask that's overlaying the motion of the teabag as it's swinging. So we can see that there's a clear path and there's no still bits of the still photograph. And what I mean by that is if I was just to brush back some of it, you'll see that there's a bit of the still left that's kind of obstructing the movement of the teabag. So we want to do away with any of that in the way and just give us a clear path to work with. So as I scrub through the timeline at the moment, you can see that the teabag is swinging free and clear. There's nothing in its way and uh, our cinemagraph is on the way. So the next thing we can do from here is to start looking at the final finishing of the cinemagraph. So in the, we're going to select both of these layers and combine them both into a smart object. The good thing again is if you ever wanted to do any individual edits on the video with a still, you can go back and double click on your smart object. It will open up and you can then do individual edits. But now what we can do is treat this as a whole unit as a single file and treat it as a single shot. So the next thing I'll do is to duplicate this file, which is now the smart object containing our still and our video file. And first of all, I'm going to turn off the top layer. So I'm going to make it invisible. So by selecting the bottom layer, I'm then going to go to Filter and Camera Raw Filter. And this is what I really like about Photoshop is that you can apply a camera raw filter to a video file. So if you want a bit more clarity or you want a bit more contrast, you've got controls here that other applications don't give you for video. Even though they have sharpness and they have saturation controls, you don't actually have the camera raw filter that I like to work with. So the first thing I'm going to do is add a little bit of contrast, probably about 20. Bring back a bit more of the highlights, just so we can see more of the window cells in the back. Maybe boost a bit of the shadows so we can see more of what's going on in the cherry ball. And add a bit of clarity. And maybe a bit of vibrance. I'm just going to do a simple curve select just to add a bit of punch in the brightness. Bring down some of the shadows, it's probably too much brightness. And we can also play with the temperature, the color temperature or the white balance that we were talking about. So that was the bottom layer that we did. The top layer, which is the duplicate, is now without a raw setting. So we can see the difference if I click them on and off. So with the top layer selected, I, I now want to add a bit of sharpness to that layer. You'll see that the, the top layer doesn't have any of the raw settings we added on the bottom layer, but they are duplicates and then we'll add some sharpness. The reason we're adding sharpness is because we want to create that photographic feel where photographs tend to feel a lot sharper than video. And if you ever go to the cinema and you watch films or you watch television programs, you, you'll know that sharpness isn't actually something that's a, that's a friend of video because we don't like to see video moving images that are too sharp. We prefer them a little bit softer and we want to have that photographic quality in our cinemagraphs. So the way I do that is by going into our filters and going into a high pass filter, which is going to give you a really ugly looking image. What we want to do is just set the radius at the bottom to about four, which means it's only really then affecting the, the, the bits in the shot with the most detail. So we'll apply that and obviously that's not the look we want to go for. So we'll change the blending mode to overlay. And what we've now got is a layer that adds a lot of sharpness. By clicking it on and off, you can see 
how much sharpness is in the shot and if it's too much you can actually bring down the opacity to say just 50 percent and that will give us a little bit less sharpness so now that we've done the basics on preparing our shot the next phase is color grading the shot to give you that creative look that you want so if you used to using photoshop to color grade your shots you can use any of those tools and apply them to your cinematographs they will work just as well so I'll just go through a few basic settings to just show basically the highlights of how I would normally do this. The first thing I would do is just add a curves layer. And with the curves, we can just select a linear contrast, which is a very subtle contrast, which adds a little bit of a punch in the highlights and a bit of a dip in the, in the shadows. And then the next layer would be the, uh, find the layer panel. And then the next option would be to use the selective color so with selective color, you can change all your individual main color palettes. So you can change your reds, your yellows, greens, blues, cyans, and magentas, and also your highlights and shadows and your midtones. And there's a whole range of color that you can bring in or take out out of any of those channels. So if you're used to Photoshop, I'm sure you know this tool, but this, is, this was an eye opener for me in bringing cinematographs into Photoshop. So the first thing I want to do is add a bit of red to the shot because we can see there's a bit of red in the, in the biscuits on the tabletop and a bit in the floor, but especially in the cherries because the cherries seem quite dark at the moment. And uh, let's see if I can bring in a bit of definition to the red as well. Actually, what I might do around the cherries is to give them their own curves and just to bring up well, their own levels, just to bring up some definition in the cherries. So what I'm doing now is just adjusting the level so we can see more of the cherries, but obviously it's affecting all the image. The good thing about these filters is that they have a layer mask, so you can use a brush and you can just brush away any of the extra highlight bits that we don't like. So just doing a really rough brush, we can then get away from anything that's, that's uh, too bright so that we only leave the levels adjustment on the cherries themselves. If you're not sure about your layer mask, you can hit Alt and click on it and you can see whatever bits are white. Those are the areas that we want to leave. So really we only want white in this one specific spot where the cherries are. So we've checked our layer mask and we've made sure that the layer mask for the cherry levels is limited to just the cherries. And uh, that means that we can go back to our selective color and we can change the color for everything else. So we've got quite a lot of red. It's probably a bit too much. The, um, the next thing I'll do is have a look at the yellow. Let's see if we can brighten up some of the yellow as well. So, just going through our color, we're, uh, we're looking at the yellow color at the moment in selective color, and I'm just adding a little bit of red um, to bring a bit more definition into the stands at the back, which is a bookshelf, and um, probably a bit of magenta as well. So next is green. We don't really have any green that we're worried about in the shot, so we'll skip green. We can go to cyan, which usually would affect anything that catches daylight. So any of these areas in the outer skirts of the shot, or maybe over there, will be caught by the cyan color. And we can see that, and even under the bowl, we can see that by adjusting the black levels of the color. So I'll boost the black levels a little bit and just bring in a bit of color pop. And then we'll go to blue. Blue will be in the bowl, really make that a bit more blue, let it pop a little bit more. And then finally we have our magenta. Magenta I don't think is very much in the shot anywhere. We can have a gauge and I don't see it showing up anywhere. So if you're not sure about what color is in your shot, if you're not sure if you have any magenta, the thing you can do is just to drag the black channel of that color backwards and forwards and you'll see the color pop or go away. So I can see there's a tiny little bit in the cherries but it's nothing to worry about. Next up we've got our white. Uh, I tend to like if we use a lot of daylight to add a bit of blue to the daylight. It just makes it feel a little bit more crisp. But again, this is subjective. We can also give it a, a much warmer feel if you want it and uh, make it feel like it was completely done under yellow lights. Um, but that's not really the look we're getting for at the moment. So just a little bit of blue to make add to the natural blue daylight coming in. And make it a bit more white. The neutrals, this is often where if you're shooting a shot of the city uh, or you're shooting a travel shot, 
very often you can have a very contrasty or very creative different look that, uh, that I've seen a lot of people on Instagram apply to their shots. And the neutrals level is usually one of the places you can do that. So you can completely change the exposure of a shot, make it a lot darker or a lot brighter. And you can bring in all sorts of colors. So you can give a bit of a strong blue tint or blue magenta tint to your shot. And you can make it a lot more red if you wanted, a lot more sunset. So if this is a sunset shot, you can add a lot more uh, red to your shot. And, uh, and by doing that, you can then really create the mood of the shot. So all of this is obviously too extreme for us. We'll just reset them. We'll probably make the shot a little bit brighter. Maybe add a bit of blue just to get a bit more of a cool feel to the shot. And then we'll go to the blacks. Black channels is the darkest images in your shot. And I'll boost it a little bit just to get a bit more vibrancy in the, in the cherry ball. And maybe we can add a bit of red just to bring those cherries out a little bit more. Cool. So that's the selective color. And if you turn it on and off, you can see a bit of a color pop. Of course, you're free to add further gradients and further filters, photo filters, and all sorts of settings onto your shot. But for the time being, I think we'll stick to this shot. Next up, we'll go and render our video. If you've followed any Cinemagraph tutorials in the past on Photoshop, you would have seen that people actually tell you to render them as GIFs. So there we go to the file and the export, and then save for web, which is usually where GIFs are made. But it's important to note that we're dealing with video files which carry a lot more color and a lot more definition, a lot more resolution. So we're not gonna be making GIFs, we're actually making a video file. And the way you do that is by going further down into your export settings and you say to render video. So the render dialog will just ask you where you want to save it. And you, can collect, you can select your output selection. And then there's various settings that you can use. The H.264 option very often gives you a very limited resolution to work with. So we don't want to do that. Um, you can either redefine your resolution or you can use the QuickTime export, which will, which will spit out a much higher quality video file. These animation quality video files are quite high quality and they're very big files. So for the purposes of this demonstration, we're just going to go with H.264 and we will redefine what it is that we want to render. Actually, switching to QuickTime has actually redefined the resolution for us. So we'll just then go and render. Okay, so we've now done our render and uh, it's come out of Photoshop and the next step is going back into Cinemagraph Pro. So this is where we're doing the finishing part of it and uh, it should be really simple and straightforward. So we'll open this file in Cinemagraph Pro. Tell it where to save. And there we have our Cinemagraph. So again, what Cinemagraph Pro has done is it's taken the first frame of the, of the video and it's overlaid it as a still. So nothing will move and that's nothing to worry about. What we want to do is just enlarge our brush size and just clean up this frame exactly like we did the first time around. And there's our shot. So, the only other thing I do, oh, it's important to remember that when you open your file for the first time in Cinemagraph Pro, there is the fade option, the crossfade option, which is by default set to 20%. For what we've created, we've created a re repeating movement in the T-back, so we don't want any fades, otherwise you'll get a nasty effect that doesn't make any sense. So we've taken that down and all we have now is a moving T-back. So the, the final thing that you need to do in Cinemagraph Pro is to select your crop options. So depending on where your Cinemagraph is going, if it's going on a website or it's going on Facebook or Instagram, there's different crop options that you can use. From my experience, I've seen that using a complete landscape shot at 16 by 9 is usually the shots that get compressed the most on Instagram. So you lose a lot of sharpness and you lose a lot of detail. And generally, these landscape shots are not the ones that look the best as Cinemagraphs. So, Short of that, I try to crop in as much as I can. The best crop to use for Instagram, for instance, is the vertical crop, which in Cinemagraph Pro is listed as a 4 by 5 aspect ratio. So really, this thing crops in and it gives you a tall shot and it's possible to also move around your crop. However, very often you will then end up cutting into important elements in your shot. So for instance, we've now lost some of the biscuits, we've lost some of the cherries, 
so it doesn't really make for a very interesting shot. Next up, it's a good thing to look at either a square crop or maybe one of the more square options. So another square option is a 5 by 4 option, which gives us a little bit more width on the shot. Or if we go 4 by 3, we get a tiny bit more. Or if we go 3 by 2, which is probably the best one, we can then completely limit our shot to the cherry bowl and the biscuits while losing a bit of the dead space on the side. And so this way we're still retaining a bit of real estate, which means Instagram will then still show it in better quality than if it were completely landscape. So we can just bring that crop in a little bit and make sure that we're not losing the uh, teacup. And so this will then be a crop that could work for this kind of shot. So from here we'll then go and export and we can just export it into a H.264 file. And again, depending on where you're taking your file or what the requests were of the client, you can then completely dictate how many loops and how many repetitions there are. And by default then that also affects your duration. So at the moment it's at three seconds. If I take that up to double the repetition, it'll be six seconds, which is probably enough. The minimum for Instagram is three seconds. So if you're sharing any of your shots, they can never be less than three seconds. Otherwise they won't get recognized. And of course your maximum is 60 seconds. But again, if your file is too long and too big, it'll take a long time to load on people's mobile phones. So sometimes they don't show up very well. And also in Cinemagraph Pro, the maximum selection you can have is 10 seconds. So if you're using this program, your shot really needs to be between three seconds and 10 seconds. So we've done our crop. We'll just go and export this file, give it a name and tell it to save. And the next step is really to, to load this into Dropbox or to iMessage it to yourself or use whatever format you use to get your shots onto your phone and then you can upload to Instagram. If you do subscribe to Cinemagraph Pro, you also get a web hosting option where you can upload your Cinemagraphs. And just in the top right corner, there's an upload button which will give you the option to upload your Cinemagraphs and you can then embed them anywhere. For instance, if you have a blog or a website which is very important because at the moment there aren't very many embedded players that are very good for Cinemagraph. So if you're used to using Vimeo or YouTube for instance, they're not that optimized for Cinemagraphs because the, the repetitive seamless motion effect that you need in your Cinemagraphs is not really something they offer. So if you get Cinemagraph Pro from Flixel Photos, they will give you that option and you can then embed your Cinemagraphs anywhere. So we've just exported our video file and uh, if we save this and we close, we can then go to the actual file that we exported, you can open this in QuickTime Pro and under the view option there's a loop selection. So basically then we can just play this and it will play seamlessly. So you can see that we've done Cinemagraph, it all swings completely seamlessly. So I hope you enjoyed this tutorial today about how to make Cinemagraphs and I look forward to seeing what Cinemagraphs you might be producing for your own feed and your own clients. If you have any questions and comments, please drop them in the comment box below. And uh, my name is Mario and thank you very much for watching.